Welcome to Conversations with Friends this morning. My name is R.O. Smith, and this is Bob Lemke, who we're going to be getting to know today. Conversation with Friends is uh, the place where faith and culture come together, and they have a dialogue with one another because we believe that they are not meant to be separate, but they are meant to always be dialoguing with one another. And so this morning, we're going to be talking with Bob and uh, hearing a little bit about his story and, and where his faith intersects his culture. So, uh, so Bob, uh, tell, tell the folks a little bit about yourself, give a little bit of background. Well, uh, I joined Point Loma Church about oh, 30 years ago, 35 years ago. Are you a San Diego man? I, I was brought to San Diego by the United States Navy. <laughs> okay, and, yes. And the Navy brought me here and uh, because I had a friend in the Navy and she uh, brought me to Point Loma Church. Okay. And uh, because uh, it was a nice place to land, it was, uh, this is where I've been for quite a while. And, uh, now, where did you grow up originally? Just originally from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Oh, okay. So it's a little cooler climate. Yeah, there. and there's and there's no reason to go back since you're here. So. All right, and then uh, your faith background. Where where did that start? Did it start here, or did was it? Did you have a faith before you I came was here? I was given a background in uh, when I grew up in Wisconsin. Okay. Uh, but it wasn't a very strong one. It, you know, I was one of those kids that was sent to church because my parents thought that that's where you should send your right, kid. Right. And then they went to church with me and then after that, you know, they kind of uh, left. And it was uh, years uh, that before I came back here and this is where I really started to have my faith. Okay, where it started to become yours. Absolutely, yeah, whatnot. right. Absolutely. And so you were in the Navy, so do you, you went to officer training school or did you go before high school? When did you? I or, right, actually, as well, graduated. actually, as you graduated I graduated high school, I, not before high school. But. Well, actually, I joined the Navy when I was in high school, okay. and then after I graduated high school, I was enlisted. But then from there, I uh, was uh, received a commission. Uh, excuse me, I re received an appointment to the Naval Academy, okay. commission out of the academy, and then then became a surface warfare officer for ten years. And ten years after that, I was an uh, engineering duty officer, working on uh, spent a lot of time on Navy ships. Okay. And what does what does a surface warfare officer do? Surface warfare officer drives those gray ships around. You know, they, they okay. uh, but they run those ships, and uh, they're skilled in um, going uh, going into battle with those ships, but also giving humanitarian aid. Um, Navy ships are used are used and asked to do a lot of th different okay. things, and the officers and enlisted folks that run those are multi talented and. And do what you have to do. Now you do. You're you're really big in missions. Yes. I'm really involved with missions here at our church. And I heard you kind of drop a word just a second ago when you, you, on the in the Navy you do humanitarian aid. Is that where you kind of got your heart for missions, or did you? I, wh I where think, did that come I from? I think that's where it was planted, Ro. But okay. it wasn't. It didn't blossom. For, okay. For decades. Okay. Right. Um, in uh, and my so my, my the big seed for my mission was in May of 1975 when we were evacuating Saigon. And uh, I was involved in, in hmm. was one of the many ships out there. But right after the evacuation, uh, my ship was called upon to go down and escort 32 Vietnamese vessels that had escaped Saigon and were with refugees. Those 32 ships had 32,000 refugees on it. Each? Total. So quick math, that's about, about 900. About 900 to 1,000 people on each ship and a ship that was normally set up for 150 or 200. Okay. So wow. we escorted those people and we spent seven or eight days with them. Uh, it's quite a story, but that seeing, uh, seeing a nation fall and being with people when they were bringing their flag down for the last time and leaving their country, mm. I, it, it, it made a big impact mm. on me, but I didn't act on it. Hmm. I, I, I stored it away, hmm. put it away, and until years later when the story came out One again. One of those things you dig up later. So as you reflect back on the time, what was like, I guess what was the one, of, one of the most moving experiences that you can remember of seeing where you were, oh. that you now tap into and can reflect on as like I, well, crucial? Well, the, the one that keeps flashing up every time I hear about refugees was, uh, we were, uh, I, was, I was on the ship, I was taking command of this particular ship, uh, because we were changing the ships from uh, reg back, re-registering these ships into the U.S. That's the only way we could bring them into the Philippines. So I was asked to take command of one of them. And uh, while we were there, uh, came on board the ship, and then they had to lower the South Vietnamese flag. 
That mm. is the last time mm. that that flag was still flying over a little bit of their country. Mm -hmm. And that, that flag went down and all the people on the ship were singing a, uh, a cappella, their national anthem, mm. as that flag went wow. down. And then it went silent and the American flag went up and then we could take them on to safety, to a safe place. Oof, that, that sounds and, powerful because, uh, it, I mean, for them, that, that, that's their, they're saying that, goodbye to their identity. That, they were still flying, they were still fly, uh, you know, living under their flag, but way. that was when their, that's when their country went down. And we may have been the last one flying that flag because mm -hmm. we were the last one to go through that particular. Uh, I'm trying to imagine being one of those refugees thinking, here this, I'm, I'm moving to a, a place of hope. You know, there's a new hope for me because I'm leaving the place that was, has caused pain, but at the same time, it's my home. Oh, I can't yeah, imagine. Yeah, and that, and they were living, I mean, and just didn't know where they were going or what they might do. Uh, and actually our church then in, uh, in the mid 70s did take on a refugee family from Vietnam. And uh, so we had some history in that. Oh, okay. But I didn't do anything about that. And I, but I it, say it's a seed. And okay. That's, that's, that's where the seed was. And it laid there for a long time. Okay. Okay. We're going to get to that in just a second. Cause I want to, cause you and I, we talked a little bit previously and I, you, we had talked about doing this uh, conversation and something you had mentioned was about uh, your struggle with scripture. Yes. Because I think a lot of people struggle yeah. with some of the same struggles you have. Okay, tell me a little bit about some of the struggles you have right. with the Holy Bible. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm not, not, you know, not no, amongst other things. No, but, no. Well, yeah. first of all, I, I, you know, I love God, but totally. uh, it's uh, the, the challenges I have uh, with uh, the Old Testament is that so there are prayers there that ask that, you know, God come in and clear the way, wipe out your enemies, things mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, oftentimes it seems that uh, my, if my God is strong, I'm going to wipe you out. If it isn't, it doesn't work that way, you know, mm. and uh, and and yet we're all we're all humankind, and we're all right. God's children, and we're we're working that. So I'm I'm a lot more comfortable with Jesus, and because Jesus showed us how to how to love, and right. the perfect love, and right. so when we get into conflicts like this, where uh, people are raging against other people, or you know we we. We walk around a, a, a city and it falls down because mm. our God is strong. Well, mm. uh, that's that's I, right. I have I have a challenges with that. I have difficulties with it. I fear God. I mean, we're mm. fear meaning respect and love God, uh, and right. I know that God can do that. And we've all been fallen, and it may be the right thing, yeah. but it is a challenge. Yeah. Right? Oh no, totally. I get. It. I, I always wonder if like God was listening to the prayers of the, the folks in the Old sure. Testament going. That's not the right prayer, but yeah. I, I know what you're trying to say. But that's not. Uh, it's yeah. It's very interesting because even when you you look at the very beginning, at when, when conflict first entered into the story, so oh, to speak, the wait. meta narrative, it was like God is now operating with a different set of rules than He created. And well, look at the Moses beauty is that coming to the promised land, totally. and, and okay, that's going to be our land. So all the other people are are, are <laughs> done away with, totally. so that we can take it. Now that's that seems that's like, a little that that's not. That's not my. I don't think we should do right. that. Right, and then and then you're wondering is it, is it a problem with the, the way we've interpreted scripture mm -hmm. for so yeah. many years? So it's very interesting. I, mean, I just I thought that was fascinating because I don't think we talk about or think about that enough. And I know people think, wait, th th something doesn't seem right. And I'm glad you you mentioned that because I've been ruminating on that and just kind of. You know, there's there's always a question that. if you know. Gee, if 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 God is powerful in here, why do we have problems? Well, right. God hasn't promised that we wouldn't have problems. Right. God has promised that with faith we can make it through. Right. And um, I think that that's kind of what we see with many of the people that we right. have. But that that was my problem. That's well, I have a lot of problems. That's one. Of the, <laughs> that's one of my challenges. No, I appreciate that honesty. Yeah. I, I appreciate sharing with that because it's, for me, it's been very thought provoking since we talked a couple of weeks ago. So I just wanted to give these folks something to chew yeah. on there. So. <laughs> yes. yeah. um, so let's move to the humanitarian, or not humanitarian, the missional effort that you've been doing here. And uh, uh, how did you get involved with missions here? Like when, you know, well, when did you first I, start? Well, this would be close to your heart. I, I sat in the pews for years and uh, once a year, uh, we would have um, the Youth Sunday. And Youth Sunday would always be after the mission hmm. week that they had spent someplace, mm. many of them in Mexico. 
And I would sit there and listen. A lot of that listen, because of Greg, Greg, because of Greg, Greg yeah, Amstutz. And, yeah. and, and their uh, mission trip. And, that, and this is the you know, high school, junior high school students. And coming back with great stories. And I, I kept sitting there and, and I said, gee, I wish I had that opportunity when I was their age. <laughs> I, I'd, like to, you know, I'd like to have done right. that. Not thinking at all that I could just do it at my, your current I age. I could just get stepped out <laughs> and go. And but I, so I kept I kept saying, "Oh Lord, I'm really sorry I missed that." Yeah, yeah. And um, gee, they have got such an advantage over me. Yeah. And then it was, um, you know, just, it, you know. Sometimes you're you can only think that far. Right. And uh, and I was always hiding behind my job. It was way too important for me to spend a week with with the kids someplace and having do God things. Right. So because um, you're in the Navy still. At this would, time. Well, no, actually, or, now, I, now I'm retired. OK. Yeah, I, I am retired, but still, you know, wrapped in a job. OK. And uh, not and feeling that's that's what God wants. Well, I wasn't thinking God wanted me to do it. It was what I thought I should be doing. Right. And that was uh, maybe not wrong. So what happened was I retired on a Friday and um, on Sunday, I was at church, and Pastor Brad put his arm around me. He said, you retired now, didn't you? And I said, yeah. I said, yeah, Friday. And he said, well, that's good. Monday, tomorrow, be here at 5.30 or 6. We have Mission Monday. I'm taking you to Mexico. And um, that got me, and I said, oh, okay, you know, Pastors are the worst. I'm just kidding. No, that, no, that, that, no that's it how was, they are. Like, cool. oh, you're yeah. done. You got free and time. So, uh, so he took me down, and my seed started to blossom. Mm. You know, it started to grow. And... Um, I uh, got a chance to, uh, so God took me there. Mission is everywhere. Mission could, right. mission could have been on my doorstep, on this doorstep. Right. My experience was going there and, yes. and being set there. And then all of a sudden finding out, not over a period, short period of time, this is really important. Mm -hmm. And this is giving something good to me. And my gosh, I can do things that God God asked me to do. And it's really not tearing me apart it's actually potentially building me up mm. and that was uh, that was a relevant you know that was a renovation or whatever it was a, a, a revelation there you go yeah that's it. Oh, yeah we oh. don't renovate we yeah it could be a renovation yeah, a renovation it could, it could have been a renovation yeah that's it right. so yeah. uh, tell us about what the 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 the, the what this church has done, uh, some people maybe know, and a lot of people maybe know or don't know about their partnership with Safe Harbors and yes. and your involvement with that and yeah. So um, or how that came even about? Obviously, the uh, war in Ukraine, the Russian war in Ukraine, has been on our televisions for for weeks. We were seeing it three or four times a day. Um, I was feeling pretty, and then and then seeing the evacuees, and of course they're being evacuated. Um, and again, it it brought up a lot of old memories. And uh, so I uh, spoke with Pastor Carla, and I said. We have done the interfaith uh, homeless shelter. Can we do? Can't we find some way to uh, have and shelter a family here? And not only was she supportive, but she also sent me to uh, talk to La Costa Presbyterian, where they'd done this for over for two years. And um, she said, if you if you feel if you feel that that's what we should be doing. You should talk to your mission committee, and then if the mission committee supports it, take it to, to the session. Do some research, take it to session. And the more research I did, the more I got uh, convinced that this is something we can do hmm. in our facility, finding some place in our facility, which is, uh, you know, can be challenging hmm. because every space is used in right. some way. Um, and uh, so she let me go at it, and uh, then session said, yeah, let's, Go out and search it and bring it back and tell us what we what we can do, mm -hmm. and that started that started the process of getting an opportunity to interview many people here on off campus um, in different different venues, bringing alongside a team with uh, especially with Ellen McBain and Ed Lynn, mm -hmm. and uh, they went to Safe Harbors to find out well what would they support us with mm -hmm. because they do provide refugee and asylum support. And we decided that that would be, we'd have to come alongside someone. And um, we chose them. So what do you think is, I guess, the benefit of hosting a refugee family? Because I think a lot of people would be like, wait, just kind of strangers on the campus wandering around. And there's maybe a sense of, 
I guess maybe uncertain of, of fear there, or kind Absolutely. of, uncertain, you know, or are they are they criminals, or you know, they have all these things, all these TV shows and movies in their head, are they, sure. you know, and so uh, well, we all do. Yes, and so what's the benefit, or why would you encourage a congregation to take something like this on? Well, we had to find a safe way to do it, and that's why we came alongside Safe Harbors, who's been doing this for 12, 12 years. And so we knew that the people, that the family that we brought in would be legally in the United States, and they would be in the, uh, stepped into the court system. So that gave us a little bit of, of that, assurance that, gave, that there's assurance a process. That there's going a process. On. It's mm -hmm. not just someone, we're, we're not just taking someone off the street or pulling someone across right. from Tijuana or something like this. Right. Um, and I think by the congregation's reaction, it gave the congregation something to point to and say, we're doing something. Mm. It may be little, but we're doing something. And I, I think that we all need to do something. We want, to, we don't, but we don't know what to do. Mm. This, is, this is a huge problem. Mm. And does it make a difference? Mm. Um, well, it does to that family. Right. It, it does to the family that God brought us. Right. We have shown that the group, everyone that I've worked around has shown tremendous love. There's so much love being poured into the project and that love is seen by the families that are, not only the families, but the people I've looked at and said, mm. my gosh, there is love here. Mm. And that gives us an opportunity to show God's love. I think that's, that's, that's big. Mm. Uh, and it's huge for the family because they'll have a safe place to be while they go through a challenging court system and, and then go on to something else. And how long are they here? I'm just to, real quick, how long are they here? Or is it like a five year process? Is it like, yep. you know, how long? It, it, uh, hopefully not that long, it, but it, it can certainly be months. And uh, some go more quickly than others. Okay. And uh, they're really up to the court system. They, they could go to the for, first court system and the uh, they may determine that they cannot have asylum, you know, in the United States, and they're gone. Or it could be that they, there's a process they have to go through, and then once getting uh, authorization to stay in and become a, uh, well, not a citizen, but as a uh, as a refugee, then they can move on to another place, have work work visas mm -hmm. and things like this. So for people that maybe are watching this, that. Uh, are a part of the church or maybe outside of our church mm -hmm. or they may, maybe go to church, they don't go to church, wherever. Um, it could feel, the re they, they, they're pretty aware of the refugee crisis and they probably see stuff on the border all the time and they feel like, I don't know if I could host a family or want to, or, uh, but what could they do in their everyday life that could maybe um, ad help address the problem? I don't know, is it uh, is it talking to a Congressman, is it praying? What what can they do that could, you know, help address, you know, and maybe help um, help with the refugee crisis in well, America? Well, I I think that that's a that's a good question. I think it starts with what does the individual really want to do, and okay. uh, and I think that the way you find that out is might might take it to God in prayer and mm. say, I need to know what to do about this. Um, Certainly Jesus showed us that you love and take care of people. Uh, that's clear. Mm -hmm. But what do I, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed right. to follow Jesus? Right. Am I supposed, well. And how many people, yeah, it's like, yeah. and even like what, what am I supposed to do and what are my abilities and limitations Absolutely. to do that? So am that's I what, supposed yeah. to open up my house and bring 50 people in and right. you know, do it and. Maybe. And it may be, yeah, that <laughs> yeah. may be, or it may be just um, knowing that oh, there, we're doing something here at church, and we can help support that, and we'll find out a little bit more about it, mm. and get a chance to stand back a little bit and see how it works. Mm. Um, that's certainly what we're doing. I mean, we're stepping into a new, a fairly new concept here, and we think a, a God, a God love concept. Yeah. Um, yeah. And hopefully then we'll be able to have more answers for people They can come to us mm. and we can give it. There are wonderful, wonderful uh, organizations that do take care of, that are credible uh, organizations in San Diego that take care of people uh, crossing the border because we're in, we're in a border state. Right. And you can come alongside them a little bit and ask them questions and work it if, you're, if you want to find mm. out about it. Mm. Um, it's, I think, 
that this again shows the difficulties we have, the political difficulties we, as many nations have, with what is our immigration policy? What is mm. it for asylum seekers and what is it for refugees? And all of those have different names and mean something right, different. Right, right, right. But um, maybe this is, if you want to do something with, uh, in governmental quarters it might be, you know, hey guys mm. and gals, let's get together and mm. make, make make something work. Uh, mm. it, it's, it's a third rail, it's a difficult one. It's mm. a difficult, difficult problem. Not only here in Europe and other places where you see you know, tens of thousands, mm. hundreds of thousands of refugees. I appreciate what you said about, um, and I, you didn't, I don't think you used this language, but you got to it when you were talking about your experience in Mexico, but this idea of like missions on your doorstep. And I, I, the thing, the phrase that came to my head was this idea of missional living. And I think when people think of missions, they think, going someplace and something big and broad and huge and that feels overwhelming but uh, you said missions is on the doorstep so when you think of like what are some uh, practical steps that people can take yeah. every day just to live out to live out mission like that missional living oh. where it's not necessarily like going on a mission no. trip or welcoming a refugee family but they're you know in their in their house I, their... I, I think missional living and I just as you speak of it that way, is just taking every person that God brings to you every day. That's not mm. an exact, mm. that's, that person that you're walking by, that person that you see on the highway, etc. that person's been brought to you. You have a choice <laughs> to do, with that person, you have a choice. You have a choice to ignore them, you have a choice to get pissed off at them, you get mm -hmm. a choice to love them, mm. you get a choice to smile and say hi. Right. And, um, and that can make a difference. Uh, right there hmm. and and when we look at missional things that's scary it's a scary yeah, term yeah. it was for me i don't want a mission wow right. but um how about um you know you can join david balfour and once a month and go down and first press and put out some food or pack right. food or do things like that that's missional support right we have 14 missional partners we mission includes taking care of people on the point hmm. uh, seniors etc yeah uh, People that need child, people that need tutoring. That's all mission. Yeah. It's just doing the right thing. We call that mission. Mm. Um, and uh, I, so I think that everyone does have that ability. I think we have the ability to say hello to our neighbor, introduce ourselves mm -hmm. to the neighbor. Mm -hmm. Do you, mm -hmm. do we know our neighbor? Right. All right. Do we know if that neighbor's hurting? Do they right. do they know if we're hurting? Mm. And and uh, so mm. that's what I I think mission is right here, but it goes out. I always say on Sunday morning when I welcome people to worship, I said, whether you were dragged here or you walked in here on your own, you're, we believe you're here on purpose. And I, when you were saying that, it's, it's inter about the idea of like treat every person that you come in contact with in your everyday life like they were brought to you on purpose. I, that, that, that's interesting. Because we usually think, oh, this event, yeah. you were brought on purpose. But just someone you walk by the street, that little well, interaction, that's interesting. And I think you tell us too, as we leave, and you and Pastor Chris and Pastor Carl, as we leave that sanctuary, you know, and and go out. Take it with you. Take mm. take God's love with you. Love that. Love. If you take God's love with you and share it, that's that's wonderful. And that's I call that mission too. Well, thank you so much, Bob. This has been so great and so uh, so helpful. And if you um, if you are part of the Point Loma Church uh, here and you want to help with the safe, with the uh, refugee family, contact Bob Lemke and they, and they might have all sorts of things that they need. Um, if you're not part of our church and you want to know more about uh, hosting a refugee family or how your church can do that, uh, contact Safe Harbors or find. As Bob said, there's there's plenty of organizations out there that do this stuff. So. Uh, please check that out. And uh, thank you for joining us for Conversation with Friends. Uh, and while you're, if you're here at, on YouTube, make sure you like and subscribe and ring the bell so that next time we put any content on uh, our page, you can get it. Or you can go to our website at pointlomachurch.org and find anything you want there. So thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.